Hello, everyone, and welcome to church in a time of coronavirus, COVID-19. In lieu of our canceled Sunday morning service, I am now sitting in our empty church sanctuary recording a modified church service for posting online. What a week this has turned out to be. Um, so much unknown and change and happening all so quickly with no clear uh, end in sight. It's enough to stress any person out. But in times like these, it's important to remember that we're not alone. As people of faith, we believe and we can trust that God is with us in the tumult and that God holds us and everyone in, on this planet in his hands. Several months ago, I chose the topic of supernovas for this Sunday's sermon, and this past Monday, I began to wonder if I needed to change my text. But as I read and then started to craft and recraft the message, this science-based sermon became more and more pastoral to me. It was nothing like stepping back in space and time to bring perspective to life. And so, for the next 25 minutes, you're going to hear a sermon about supernovas. And as you listen, know that the God who made all that you're going to hear about the nature of supernovas, that that God is the God who is with you. And before we get into that, join me in a prayer. Uh, God Almighty, creator of the universe, uh, we pray that uh, you would, uh, by your spirit, draw near to us all now. Um, Things are uh, kind of wild on our planet, and a lot of people are unsure and feeling anxious, and, uh, and, and, and some are doubting, and some are worried, and uh, we, we don't know what, quite know what's happening. We don't quite know what to do. We don't quite know how long this is going to last. Um, so as we struggle with this imminent uh, threat to uh, the lives and the health of a lot of people, especially the vulnerable people, the weak people, um, we pray that you would draw near to us, maker of all things, and give us wisdom and strength and perspective, especially perspective, um, as we contemplate your ways in, in sort of cosmic time. Make our time now, today, uh, filled with just a little bit more peace and a sense of your presence and uh, a comfort and a hope for the future. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Cassiopeia A was a star in our Milky Way galaxy that went supernova approximately 11,000 years ago. And light from that explosion was visible on Earth in the year 1680. According to the Daily Galaxy, quote, um, there is on average only one supernova per galaxy per century. There is something on the order of 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Taking 10 billion years for the age of the universe, it's actually 13.8 billion, 
but stars didn't form during the first few hundred million, Dr. Richard Mashotsky of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center derived a figure of 100 billion supernovae per year, or 30 superno supernovae, 30 supernovae per second in the observable universe. So keep that statistic in mind as you listen to this message. Some 45,000 stars will go supernova over the next 20, 25 minutes. And as people of faith, we believe that God has something to do with all of these celestial events. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and creation wasn't just a one-time event. Creation happens all the time. It's happening right now, 30 times per second. And supernovas, these were God's idea. Their physical nature and way of being were thoughts that God had before they ever came to be. God was the first physicist, and in God's infinite wisdom in relation to all things, made supernovas and the process of supernovas, how they play out, as a crucial element in his universe-building plan. And God did all of that creating work, the Bible teaches us, through Jesus. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. So Jesus had something to do with Cassiopeia A. He is the universe ordering mind in behind all things, the architect, the mathematician, the astronomer. And if this is true, if the universe was made at his command, then my question is, what do the ways of supernova Cassiopeia A say about who you are? Jesus. Seven or eight years ago, I was down in California at a uh, John Templeton Foundation funded faith science gig for three days, and they brought together theologians and scientists to talk to each other and see how these two um, wisdom streams can flow together. And at one of the talks, uh, Jennifer Wiseman, the head of the Hubble Space Telescope Project, um, obviously she has uh, a good eye on the universe, gave a talk about the nature of the universe, showing pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And, you know, the whole time we're watching, uh, it was just uh, deeply compelling to, and, and to see her wisdom and understanding of all things universal, uh, a truly unique experience. And at the end of the talk, I had a question that was just bugging me the whole time. I, I thought, well, this is a person who's seen it all. I've probably seen what most human beings will never see as fully as she's seen it. And so I asked her the question, I said, what, what does having seen the universe through the space telescope the way you have, what, what does that tell you about what, who God is and what God is like? And she had this long pause in response, and, and I think she probably needs a lot more time to answer it, but she said, well, I guess one thing it tells me is that God is patient. And yeah, clearly 13.8 billion years is, is a lot of patience, but I remember walking away and thinking, oh, I want more than that. I want a, a bigger answer, a bigger answer from a scientist on what the universe says about God. And as we're all a group of us walking back to our rooms that night, I was talking with a University of Minnesota um, physicist who uh, was working with data from the Mars rover project, Heidi Manning. And I said, yeah, I was a bit frustrated. And she said, yeah, me too. She said, I thought about this a bit. And, you know, when I think of the universe, I, I see a sort of death and resurrection pattern playing out through the nature of supernovas. And as she started to explain it, you know, my eyes brightened and I looked over to her and I said, that will preach. And so she made a commitment to work with me to do some research on the death and resurrection nature of stars and then bring that into a conversation with the death and resurrection nature of Jesus. And as we spoke and conversed for a period of weeks, I realized that, of course, a dying and resurrecting Jesus would make a universe like this. And so it made me wonder how the universe would shine light 13.8 billion years of wisdom and illumination onto the mystery of a dying and resurrecting Jesus. And so I asked Dr. Manning if she could briefly describe how the dying and resurrecting of stars via supernovas plays out. And she uh, wrote me this. 
During the Big Bang, only hydrogen, helium, and a little lithium were created. Not nearly enough elements for life as we know it to exist. Heavier and more complex elements came about through the life and death of stars. Two kinds, low-mass stars and high-mass stars. And when a low-mass star dies, the element carbon is produced. When a high-mass star starts to die, elements like oxygen, neon, magnesium, and so on, up the periodic table until you reach iron, are produced. And then, when that high-mass star explodes in a supernova, heavier elements than iron are made. The heavier elements that make, up, make us up are created in the end stages of a high-mass star's life. And it is only through the death of these stars that the elements for life are created. So get this. We would not be here were it not for the death and resurrection of all of these stars. The elements in star form had to, quote-unquote, die in order for matter to be transformed and made into something new. And for billions of years, God has been doing this. Li life on Earth, as we know it, is just the last few seconds of a very long cosmic story. And all of our COVID-19 anxieties, I mean, they're milliseconds in the context of that larger created story. Anyways, as I thought about what Dr. Manning wrote about the workings of supernovas, a few thoughts came to mind, theological thoughts about how they illumine the nature of a dying and resurrecting God. First of all, at a most basic level, supernovas teach us that matter matters to God. The Christian faith uh, has always held to the truth that Jesus' resurrection was a bodily resurrection. And after his resurrection, Jesus said it is to his disciples, It is I myself, handle me, touch me, and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see I have. And theologically, by raising Jesus' body, God says, bodies matter to me. Matter matters to me. All matter matters to me. And we can draw that conclusion because we know that Jesus in the book of Revelation says, I'm making all things new. So all matter matters to God. And what's interesting, given what we now know about supernovas creating the elements that enable our bodies to be, is that Jesus' physical body, born to his mother Mary, was made up of the star stuff he made. A couple of years ago, I read this quote from Notre Dame philosopher of science, Ernan McMullen. When Christ took on human nature, the DNA that made him the son of Mary may have linked him to a more ancient heritage, stretching far beyond Adam to the shallows of unimaginably ancient seas. And so, in the incarnation, it would not have just been, it would not have been just human nature that was joined to the divine, but in a less direct but no less real sense all those myriad organisms that had unknowingly over the eons shaped the way for the coming of the human. And taking that a step further, when Christ took on a human body and the DNA that shaped that body, he also took on all of the heavier elements of the universe that make up all of life on earth that came to us and came into being through supernovas. So in a very real sense, through his death, resurrection, and ascension, Jesus does make all things new. And, and the body that Jesus now has, that died, was resurrected, and is now taken up into the Godhead, now sitting at the right hand of God, that body is made up of all of the elements that came to be, in part, as the result of supernovas. So matter matters a lot to God. You, your body matters a lot to God. Your health, the health of your body matters to God. For billions of years, through the death and resurrection of stars, 
God in the Christian story was foreshadowing Jesus' death and resurrection. And then through that death, resurrection, and ascension, all things, in a very real sense, were reunited with God. Every element that fills our universe, every part of this physical world he made over all time, everyone who's ever covenanted with God or been called God's people, every nation, tongue, and tribe, every one of you, every atom that makes up you, is reunited with God through Jesus. Matter matters that much to God. You matter that much to God. Your body in the middle of a coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic matters that much to God. And yes, the, the dying and resurrecting of Jesus in the Christian story 2,000 years ago, well, that makes the matter matters point quite clearly. But now I'm thinking so too does 13.8 billion or so years of elemental death and resurrection via supernovas. God was saying, matter matters to me long before any of us were around to hear. God was whispering death and resurrection for eons. This is how I mysteriously make all things new. It's happening right now, 30 times a second. Do you not hear? Can you not see what I'm saying? And I think the death and resurrection of matter and stars also says another related thing about Jesus's and our death and resurrection. This idea that matter continues. According to Dr. Manning, when a low mass star dies, three helium atoms fuse to become carbon. So in a sense, what they are is transformed and becomes something more. And again, another important point in our Christian understanding of resurrection is the idea of continuity. When, when Jesus resurrected, it was his former body that became his new glorified body. There were still scars on the body. <laughs> None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? They, they knew it was the Lord. And while his physical form had been somehow mysteriously transformed and glorified, it was still recognizable as him. Theologian Gordon Spikeman wrote, We do not know with full clarity what we shall be, but we do know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. For just as there is continuity between the seed and the plant, so there will be continuity between the present body and the resurrection body. And yet, just as one cannot tell from the appearance of the seed what the future plant will look like, so we cannot tell by observing the present body exactly what the resurrection body will be like. But there will be something of what's here now that will continue. Jesus is proof of that. And so are three helium atoms forming to make carbon. That when, when three helium atoms form carbon, it's, it's a kind of transformed continuance of helium. And carbon making us up is a further transformation. And our mortal bodies becoming glorified bodies one day will be the final transformation, we think. And in the Bible, the Old Testament and the Old Covenants are all part of God's New Testament, New Covenant plan. It, it, it continues. It's all one story to God. And Jesus affirmed that when he said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So even as the post-Big Bang's hydrogen, helium, and lithium have continued to this day, I think they'll continue for all eternity. And I think that God has been foreshadowing this for billions and billions of years through the cosmos and then through all those covenants in the Old and New Testament and then and now through Christ. All matter continues. God's creation continues. God continues. 
in what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life right now as you face a global academic, a, a, a global pandemic, as you face your fears, as you face your humanity, as you face your desire to hoard, as you face your desire to run, as you face your desire to do whatever, all that the Spirit is doing right now and showing you about who you are and reshaping you will in some way be transformed and go on forever. How this virus is humbling you. How we're realizing as a, as a planet our frailties and our interconnectedness how we're seeing our hearts and how we're seeing, and for me, how we take so much for granted all the time. I mean, now is part of God's eternity, even as helium at the Big Bang is part of God's universe today. And God won't toss away anything that he's made or any way that he shaped it, but he uses it all and works it all for his greater universal, eternal good. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, and you. And one day you'll be more by that work of God. This is God's universal plan for us, this world that he so loves. This is where God is going with your eternal life, which my wife always reminds me of when I start to freak out or get anxious about things. I don't worry about it. Even if I die, and I haven't, I'm, this is part of my eternal life, she reminds me. I mean, if you believe that, then, then believe that. You, you have nothing to be afraid of. Over 13.8 billion years, God took hydrogen, helium, and lithium and made them into all that exists today. And one day, all that exists today will be made perfect and new and as it should be in Christ. And then, for all we know... God may continue on his trajectory and take all that he's made and then made new and then make more and more and more out of it all forever. From glory unto glory unto glory for his glory. So perhaps through supernovas, God has been showing his hand, making a creational covenant promise Spring it when we didn't nobody be here. Pre-promising billions of years ago, long before the Bible was ever written, that I make things new and matter matters to me. For billions of years, whispering that I'm going to take care of all this matter now and forever. And all of that happening, made through, made new, redeemed, and held forever through the resurrected, the dying and resurrecting, and now ascended Jesus. The one that God exalted to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, name, character, being, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Jesus who's with you right now in our troubled world. He's with you as you face whatever you're facing now and next year and for the rest of your life with all of your anxieties and questions and fears and doubts and joys. He is with you. I will not leave you alone, he promised. I will come back to you. This personal saving Jesus is the cosmic, eternal creator, Christ. The one who died for you, died for all things. And even as science now enables us to look back 13.8 billion years and see all this stuff, our faith can now help us look forward to the next 13.8 billion years. You are part of a very big God story. And there is nothing to be afraid of. Our world belongs to God. Our universe belongs to God. You belong to God. And 
and even as light from supernova Cassiopeia A traveled for more than 11,000 years before it reached us in the 17th century, there is a light that has been coming toward us since the beginning of time, before anyone even knew. The light of the world, shining for all eternity, bringing light and love and beauty and saving to the cosmos, to you and to me. A light that will shine forever. And surely, his goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives, including these days, this week, this month, whatever lies ahead. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray. So when we as people of faith, God, talk about trusting in you in a time of pandemic, help us to know that you, this God, who did all of this and infinitely much, infinitely more, much, much more than this, are the God that we're putting our trust in. And where we don't have the faith, and when we're finding it hard to believe, um, show us by your spirit what's true about who you are. Help us to know you in the fullness of your name, the creator of heaven and earth. And in the knowing, in the loving, in the restoring of our souls, in the kindling of our hearts, in the awakening of our imaginations, in the quieting of our spirits, bring yourself <laughs> the glory to your name, we pray. Have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. All right, this is uh, week one of online church during a pandemic. And we just had a long meeting with our leaders this morning, and we have no idea how long we're going to be doing this. But until we do meet again those who are part of our local community, um, leave uh, this talk with God's blessing. May the grace of God, your heavenly Father, the wellspring of all creation, and the love and resurrecting, life-renewing power of Jesus Christ, his Son, and the wisdom in behind the universe, and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit, a spirit that shows us who God is and uh, changes and transforms hearts, even as it transforms matter for billions of years, be with you and go with you and keep you all. Amen. <laughs>